you're doing theater when you should be doing debate, which would be great. No, no, it's, it's, it's not, not honest. What you do is not honest. What you do is partisan honest. hackery. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you why I, I know You have on your show, and you sniff his throne, and you're accusing us of partisan hackery? Absolutely. You're You've a, got to be kidding me. You're on, on CNN. And you say. My, the show that leads into me is puppets making crank phone calls. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Well, I'm, when you have people on for just knee-jerk, Reactionary talk. Wait, I thought you were gonna be funny. Come on, be funny. No, no, I'm not gonna be your monkey. Yeah, it's someone who watches your show and cannot take it anymore. I just can't. What's it like to have dinner with you? It must I'm be just... excruciating. Do you like lecture people like this? Or do you come over to their house and sit and lecture them? And, you know, they're not doing the right thing, that they're missing their opportunities, evading their responsibilities? If I think they are. Look, I wouldn't want to eat with you, man. That's horrible. I know, and you won't. It's Britney, bitch. And uh, the Iraq, everywhere, like, such as. I'm supposed to be the franchise player, and we're in here talking about practice. Was that? Ladies and gentlemen, we got them. Out, Charlie! Out! Our next door neighbors are foreign countries. I call upon all nations to do everything they can to stop these terrorist killers. Thank, Thank you. you. Now watch this drive. Hey everybody, welcome to Remember Shuffle. My name is Ben, with me as always is my co-host Rodano. Welcome to the program! Boy, do we have a good show for you today. I have my pen pointed, I am shuffling my papers, and we are ready to eviscerate the news. You did the paper yeah, thing. You I'm did ready the paper to go. Thing. <laughs> I've got my papers ruffled, I'm scribbling furiously. John Stewart ASMR. <laughs> Giordano for this episode has dyed his hair silver gray. He's rocking his silver fox look right now. Yes, and today, if you couldn't have guessed from Giordano's hello this week, we are discussing The Daily Show with John Stewart. Yes, and we are joined by a good friend of mine, a podcast host himself of Cheeseburger in Babylon. I'd like to introduce my friend Isaac Eager. Hey, fellas. So good to be here. Hell yeah. Before we really get going, why don't we all just... Discuss our own personal relationship with this absolute institution of the 2000s, the John Stewart Daily Show. Yeah, Isaac, we really wanted to have you on because you're the one of the biggest experts of the show that <laughs> I know. Yeah. This is a very difficult episode because there are thousands of Daily Show episodes. And so how do you summarize thousands of episodes? But you've seen all of the episodes from which eras? I remember seeing the Sidney Crawford, Craig Kilborn Daily Show, the the show prior to Jon Stewart hosting, just because Sidney Crawford was so beautiful, that stuck out in my horny young mind. But yeah, I was a dedicated Daily Show watcher from as long as I can remember. It was kind of a, a family event. We would watch the rerun, the not the 11 p.m. show, but the 7 p.m. following day show every day at dinner mm. together. This was a family show for you. It was a family show, yes. And it informed my political worldview. And I think that my dad kind of looks like Jon Stewart a little bit and John Stewart was a part of my like Jewish sense of self like I, I he was like a, a member of the <laughs> team like, it was like this is our guy he's handsome people like him he's not overly nebbish he's a cool Jew True. a leather jacket wearing Jew it was nice yeah he was very handsome in those first seasons I was shocked and he always says that he sort of ages like an avocado and you do see that five years into the show but those first few seasons like what a hunk I think he still looks he's a silver fox he's melted a little bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my experience with the show was very much in line with how the book portrayed most Daily Show fans, which was stone slackers in college. Guys who were watching this at 11 p.m. after they had smoked weed to get uh, some cheap laugh. Yes, and we should mention that one of our main sources for this episode was the book An Oral History of the Daily Show, which was written by producers, writers, correspondents, and Jon Stewart himself about the entire run of the Daily Show. Yeah. Yeah, I came to the show kind of late. I was a religious Daily Show watcher in undergrad, like 2008 to 2012, first Obama term. That was what I watched every morning with my morning coffee on the shitty Comedy Central player. I watched last night's Daily Show. And I was practically like a Jon Stewart for president lib in 2012. I was like, let's tap out Obama, get Jon Stewart on the ticket. <laughs> yeah, which is not his best work. And then I gradually tapered off with the show from 2012 to 15 until he left. But I did did make a point to watch his final, final 
final episode. This was like an event, I remember. Of course. At the end of MASH, <laughs> watching Jon Stewart's final episode. The Bush era, I think that was, it's Simpsons season three through eight. You know, it's golden era, the strongest cast, best writers. And I think the appropriate political milieu for something like The Daily Show to exist, that was where it was strongest and where it was most needed. And yeah, I, I watched it through the Obama era. And I do remember it was almost just reflexive. It wasn't because I wanted to. It was just because, God, this is what I do. I watch The Daily Show, even as my politics slowly began to change as well. But yeah, I do think that it, it was an appropriate conclusion to the Jon Stewart era. He retired just before Trump got elected. And I always found it yeah. very funny where people were being like, oh my God, if only The Daily Show was still on during the Trump administration, we would have gotten the orange guy somehow. <laughs> he would have destroyed him. You know, he would have, oh, it's like, okay. He would have eviscerated yeah. him yeah. every yeah. night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, there was literally nowhere else we could have gone for that. <laughs> a comedian at a desk talking about yeah. Trump. Before we get into this, I do want to set up a little roadmap for the show today, give the audience a sense of what's coming. So first, we're going to discuss four distinct eras that we've identified in The Daily Show history. The first era is from 1998 to 2001, and this is the leather jacket Stewart era. This is John Stewart at his most like Gen X and absurdist. Next up, we have the, the Bush era that we were talking about, which is what we're calling the Righteous Anger era, when The Daily Show was at its strongest, followed by the lecture series, Stuart, when uh, John Stewart was most like uh, Obama. And <laughs> we'll finish that up today with I, what I think will be the most fun segment, which is just the dog shit era, which is uh, <laughs> The Daily Show since 2016. Oh. And then we'll discuss broad themes about The Daily Show, the nature of satire, the way that it talks about class politics or lack thereof. And finally, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about echoes in the culture. But I want to open up the show with an idea that you guys were just talking about. We all read an oral history of The Daily Show to get ready for this episode. And one point of view that they always had was the quote, are you seeing this? That's how they viewed themselves during the Bush era was every other news source was towing the Bush party line. You had Judith Miller in the New York Times saying that we need to invade Iraq. And Jon Stewart was the only person saying, is anyone else seeing this? How crazy and insane all the rest of the media is being about the Bush administration after 9-11. And so that's their mantra. Is, are you seeing this? And then we know that during the Trump era, the Daily Show is still trying to do, are you seeing this with Trump? And it's like, yes, motherfucker, I'm seeing this. It's on every channel and on everybody's Instagram story. It is the only thing I can see. <laughs> I see it on the news. I see it on social media. Trump lives free in my brain. I know the name of every one of his cabinet <laughs> members. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Am I seeing this? And since then, since the Daily Show, it almost almost seems like every late night show has become The Daily Show, which we'll get into as we go. Everybody from Ben Shapiro to The Late Show, everybody's shows became The Daily Show because it was such a trendsetter in its own way. It's a unique brand of comedy I am calling desk comedy. You are seated at a desk. You are not standing up. You are trying to be a newsman. So yeah, let's start with our first era, the leather jacket steward. So we're not going to talk too much about the Craig Kilborn era of the show, but that's the guy who hosted it for the first two seasons and they needed to get a new host and they find this kind of 90s alt comic named John Stewart. And if you have ever seen the Simpsons episode where Krusty tries to be political and he puts on a leather jacket, that was apparently every white comedian in the 90s. Because if you look up John Stewart, I watched a <laughs> clip from him performing at Boston University and the first minute and a half is just about smoking and the rules around smoking. It could be a fucking Dennis Leary bit. He makes a big show of pulling out a cigarette. He says, oh, I'm not allowed to smoke here? Lights it anyway. It's like a fucking badass. He doesn't care, dude. He doesn't care about fucking anything. In this era, some of his stand-up punchlines are, it's very George Carlin-esque. It's like, we got really smart bombs, we got really stupid children about how we fund the military, but not education. Or, we bombed Somalia, but we made sure to feed them first. You enjoy your sandwich now run this is leather jacket crusty or what have you uh -huh. and i watched a couple clips of the actual daily show in this era and craig kilborn had this very gen x-y almost bordering on shock jock style of humor and is way less political than what john stewart would eventually do way less i guess you could say ideological like he has an entire story a segment a four minute segment about popeye's marriage the fictional character popeye was getting married and it builds up to a punchline 
about how olive oil just doesn't want any fisting at her marriage. And it cuts to a shot of Popeye's giant <laughs> forearms. That's a pretty good joke. I, I like, that's a good one. <laughs> What's the problem? Oh, okay. The truth tellers of society. Yeah. Speaking truth to power. <laughs> But you can see Jon Stewart just seems uncomfortable delivering this hack joke. There's this growing period where Jon Stewart's not comfortable in a suit and he wanted to keep wearing his leather jacket. But they said, no, this is a parody of 24 hour news. You want to talk about right place, right time. Even before the Bush era and the war on terror and the war in Iraq and the bailouts and all that shit. He starts this show or Comedy Central hires him for the show at a time where for the first time they are producing 120 hours of cable news a day the politics of the show aren't just the war was bad and the bailouts were bad and you know some like good lib positions it's also like what the fuck our media is dog shit there's so much of it but it is so bad i also just think craig kilborn is too tall <laughs> he was an asshole like he had this kind of aura he was imposing in a smarmy way whereas i think john stewart and i think this is part of his success he's the first like parasocial celebrity in my life i really felt like mm. the warmth of of him but Craig Kilborn would never have had that kind of intimacy with it, the audience because he was too tall he was frat handsome I guess he just mm. didn't have the proper look that I think Jon Stewart provided yes Jon Stewart one of his greatest strengths I think is his self-effacing nature he's very good at it he uses it often and he can be sincere could you imagine Craig Kilborn delivering the post 9-11 speech oh, that Jon Stewart did <laughs> no I, I wish there was enough footage of him to do a proper impression but I I can't even imagine what it would be like. I have no idea what Craig Kilborn talks like. I have no idea if he's alive or dead. <laughs> yeah, <my> poor guy. <laughs> so yeah, just to get back to what Ben was saying about this being a parody news show, sometimes the initial ideology of this show gets lost because it was on for so long. But the idea is that it, it has all the trappings of a news show, the news alerts and the graphics, and it's presented the way that CNN is or Fox News is, but it's reporting on the dumbest shit ever. And so it, it has all mm -hmm. of the formality of CNN but they're reporting on like the guy with the world's longest fingernails. And I think that a lot of this comes from Ben Carlin, who's one of the showrunners of The Daily Show until 2006. This is a guy from The Onion. He actually coined the term area man that The Onion uses all the time. And you can see the DNA of The Onion in this Daily Show premise, which is let's present the most asinine topics with the formality of real news. And so I think that the show is extremely good in this era, mostly because of the cast that it had. So, you know, people, I think, assume that Steve Carell was on the show for like a season or two, but Steve Carell's around for six seasons in nearly 300 episodes. And between Steve Carell, Stephen Colbert, and Jon Stewart, those are generational talents, I believe. Ben disagrees with me on this, but... Yeah, and mm -hmm. fuck, fuck Mo Rocca. Fuck Mo Rocca. You know, his <laughs> NPR ass. Yeah. You know what? He's he's a guy you need on the team to fill time, but he, you know, Steve Carell, Steve Colbert, Jon Stewart, when you have that cast where Jon Stewart might be the third most talented person on the show. It's going to result in a very, very good show. And a lot of the bits that they were doing in this era, like pre 9-11, pre George Bush administration, were doing the news, but taking like a tangential or absurdist position with relation to the news, right? Sort of a postmodern joke take on the news. And so they would have Steve Carell do uh, a bit where he needs to report on Harry Potter, how all the kids are reading Harry Potter. But Steve Carell just fundamentally doesn't understand how a news show is supposed to work or the, the bit is he's reporting on reading the way they normally talk about video games where it's like oh the kids their eyes are glazed over they're not playing outside they're not going to Chuck E. Cheese and he's interviewing a guy who runs the Chuck E. Cheese and he's like there are no kids here they're all at home reading Harry Potter and he's like yeah well also it's closed it's nine o'clock at night and you asked me to do this interview when it's closed and they do a really good job of the joke being on the correspondent Steve Carell is the butt of the joke because he's he's playing Brick Tamlin in a lot of these interview segments and it's a big change from what we'll see later on where Jordan Klepper or someone is trying to make the joke on the person they're interviewing and being like, look how stupid this idiot is. Yeah, the joke is meant to be on the news and newsmen, which is why Steve Colbert and Steve Carell are so perfect because they are plain Catholic, straight lace looking white guys. They look like the types of guys that would be on Fox News. Fuck, forget Fox News. They look like a good night and good luck ass motherfucker. Like, yes. 
that's the news. Watch out for communists. <laughs> what have you. I think it's also important to point out that they came from an, an improv background, whereas Stuart was of the, the stand-up world. And I think that that combination mm-hmm. was really well suited for their positions. They're like a, the, the perfect basketball team where you have the right combination of people to make a good system. Because, yeah, their improv worked perfectly for the street stuff. And Stephen Colbert in the oral history book does come across as a constant prankster. Like, he can't stop doing bit. He is one of those kind of guys, which seems kind of exhausting. But, I, you know, it, it comes across <laughs> as, like, pretty charming guy as well. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. They're able to go dead in the eyes where you really believe <laughs> yeah, yeah. they're, just like, stupid enough to, to take this position on sincerely. And I think that that's something that gets lost in a lot of the recent correspondence is the recent correspondents know what position they're actually on, whereas with Steve Carell, you really do believe he's this stupid. There's a great segment, by the way, called Produce Pete, where they're making fun of the fact that they have to fill time on a 24-hour news network by just doing stories on garlic or, or like what's in season. <laughs> and so if you want to check out any Steve Carell's bits from that early Daily Show, I would recommend uh, the Produce Pete series. And the Steven versus Steven, too. Yes, uh, even Stevens, their Crossfire parody. Very good. Now, one of the most exotic ways to prepare cabbage is the Korean dish called kimchi. Chop up some cabbage, cucumbers, and some other veggies of your choice in a large mason jar. Add a mixture of two parts water, one part vinegar, some pepper, a couple cloves of garlic. Now, traditionally, you are to bury the concoction for up to two weeks underground. There it is. It's been there for about a month. Let's, um, shall we? Let's try it. Okay, let's shall. (laughs) Here we go, and... (laughs) Son of a bitch! God! God! And the thing about this era is that this is, and I mean this as a compliment, as a genuine good faith compliment, this is the show kind of at its most stupid in terms of just like a dumb bit. But because of its meta frame, I think it's elevated. So a couple examples that I have, there's one where the Steve Carell character learns that Crisco, the vegetarian lard substitute, is made from vegetables. And he just eats straight vegetable lard on camera as if it's like getting his five to seven servings of vegetable a day. Incredibly fucking and stupid but yeah within the context of a fake news program with this guy doing it it's kind of funny it's good for a laugh or there's another one i saw after the show had been on for only four years Stephen colbert records a four-year anniversary video that's just a loop it's like let's look back to the time i wished you a good fourth year anniversary and they run the same clip in a loop three times and then once the clip breaks he just chugs a 40 of malt liquor and that's it that's the bit it's like it's most meta and absurd <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it has the most postmodern bent to it in this very Gen X way of the, the joke is your expectation for what a news program should look like and then subverting that, having the correspondent mm-hmm. not know what the host is talking about. Did you guys ever watch uh, Strangers with Candy? No. So that's Stephen Colbert's first TV show. I mean, he was on the Dana Carvey show with Steve Carell, but simultaneously mm-hmm. on Comedy Central, Stephen Colbert was doing this show called Strangers with Candy starring Amy Sedaris. And he played kind of like a similar character and it's a great show and the first thing that you see Stephen Colbert do is he's writing on a chalkboard he says now students remember your essays on Hiroshima are due next week now make it sure that it's nothing to and then he writes on the board it's so wild to see where he came from and like the kind of humor he was doing to what he's doing now. I, mean, I guess he's still making gay jokes saying that Donald Trump is sucking Putin's dick. And something we will bring up uh, in a little bit when we talk about how the show started to censor itself a lot more and sometimes became better, but in sometimes became worse because they just like weren't as biting. So now we're going to talk about the second era of the show, the Bush era, the righteous anger period of the show. And to me, watching clips from this era, I watched a lot of Daily Show prepare for this episode, by the way. And Jon Stewart says of his show that his show is like egg salad. You can make the best egg salad in the world and two weeks later, get that egg salad out of my face because it's news. And so I ate a lot of egg salad this week. But every time he talked about Bush, it was like hitting a baseball with the fat part of the bat. It was like good, clean contact. I laughed out loud almost every time I watched a clip about Bush. Bush is the ultimate muse for Jon Stewart. Yeah, muse or white whale in that he's constantly chasing it but will never get. (laughs) 
And this is really where the are you seeing this shit becomes most prominent because every other news source is a cheerleader for the war in Iraq or for the Bush administration after 9-11. And John Stewart, he has a segment called Mesopotamia, which is about how the war on terror is going horribly. And he's doing that months after the war starts. He is extremely critical of the war in Iraq, basically from the very beginning, which is so rare in media at that time. And so he really was an important figure. And we have a, a couple clips to, of his incredulity at what the Bush administration was doing and how nobody else was covering it. So I'll, I'll play. This is July of 2003 and them realizing that there's no WMDs in Iraq. How did the CIA get it so wrong? Committee Chairman, Republican Senator Pat Roberts. The committee concluded that the intelligence community was suffering from what we call a collective group think, which led analysts and collectors and managers to presume that Iraq had active and growing WMD programs. Really? Group think? Because um, I was thinking brain fart. You know, if only we'd had a Senate Intelligence Committee to look into that stuff before the war. Just like, are you seeing this? The government is blaming a war on on groupthink, on the fact that everybody was thinking the same thing. Like, that's not a justifiable answer for leading us to war. For goofing up. <laughs> we just did a goof, right? Like, the idea that this would be exculpatory, excusing for like, yeah, you fucked up. And again, fucked up is the best possible reading of what happened and not like you lied with malicious intent, which is what actually happened. I have another clip here of uh, him sort of ripping on them for using September 11th to justify anything they did. I can't put my finger on it, but I feel like there was one more reason. And remember, September 11th changed the equation. We've taken a number of steps since September 11th. America was attacked on September 11th. Sharing going on since September 11th, September 11th, that taught us in a post-September 11th world. Boy, they're hitting that drum. <laughs> Because September 11th changed the equation. In fact, I, I have the new equation right here. Uh, September 11th plus X, where X signifies whatever we say equals shut the f up. I love that. I think it's really good. We mentioned this on our Iraq war episode, but it's hard to emphasize how much people were getting canceled. Phil Donahue got his ass fucking shit canned for speaking out against this war. Jon Stewart can get away with it because he's not on a major network. He's on Comedy Central. And I know these bits that we play, they might seem very tame, right? Or they are very tame, right? Like, oh, you're talking about groupthink? What about brain fart? <laughs> cool, man. It's, again, a very George Carlin, like, stream of consciousness wordplay style bit or joke. It's hard to appreciate how much this was manna from heaven in the desert back in the 2000s. How much we needed this. Rage Against the Machine had their entire catalog banned from the radio after 9-11. The Dixie Chicks got their shit pulled. Phil Donahue's getting fired, right? There were so few voices. This is the OG cancel culture. It is like 2000s War on Terror. But luckily we had this one guy to make these jokes and it was something. Yeah. And it was accessible because growing up in a small town in Florida, alternate media didn't really exist. It's something you had to either know about. My dad got Z Magazine and The Nation and Counterpunch delivered to him. So I had that mm -hmm. part. You know, I'd rather watch TV than read The Nation, of course. But to have this access to a counter narrative was, like you said, absolutely manna from heaven. And the fact that it was fun too, it wasn't cloying or too self serious. It made it cool. Like you were actually mm -hmm. cool to to participate yeah. in this. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, you frequently see on leftist pages like, eventually you need to read theory. You can't just post memes or whatever. Fuck that. This is the meme form of not reading theory. Do I want to read manufacturing consent or do I want to see Jon Stewart eviscerate the media? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and have him say, you're not crazy. I'm seeing this too. When the Republican convention cuts to George Bush in a classroom and he's not at the convention, you know, he's at a classroom in Ohio because he's focused on education. Forget the fact that it's nine o'clock at night in August, <laughs> he's saying, I am seeing this shit too. And you're not alone. This is fucking stupid. You're not taking crazy pills. I think it was very cathartic for people. And if I could add, that clip's great because, yeah, they have this big reveal that Bush cares so much about education. He's in a classroom and there are students in this classroom. It's not empty. So the joke is like he cares so much about education that he forced <laughs> kids to stay in school until 9 p.m. in the summertime for his fucking little political blitz for his <laughs> little ad spot. <laughs> 
And we're going to have some complaints in the next era about his approach to the Obama administration. But I thought he was very good at ripping on Democrats, too, like almost ripping on them existentially. And so I have a couple of clips here. This is a clip from the vice presidential debate between Edwards and Dick Cheney. And remember, Dick Cheney's uh, daughter is gay. So Edwards is uh, complimenting him on that. That's from I think the vice president and his wife love their daughter. I think they love her very much. And and you can't have anything but respect for the fact that they're willing to talk about the fact that they have a gay daughter. Yes, we admire your love for your gay daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Just so good at pointing out that the Democrats are trying to have their cake and eat it, too. <laughs> Here's another clip of just straight up ripping on the Democrats and talking about how, like, I think this is like 2004. So at this point, they're opposed to the war. And he's like, it, it literally is not relevant that you're opposed to the war now <laughs> when we needed you to be opposed to it was a year ago. The war has happened. The war has happened. Time is linear. Like Jay Rockefeller of West Virginia. The fact is that the administration at all levels and to some extent us, use bad information to bolster its case for war. And we in Congress would not have authorized that war. We would not have authorized that war. Democrats always standing up for what they later realize they should have believed in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good stuff. One more anti-Bush bit, and then we can uh, move on here. On the campaign trail yesterday, President Bush addressed the findings about the lack of findings. I tell you what we do know. Saddam Hussein had the capacity to make weapons. See, he had the ability to make them. He had the intent. We knew he hated America. In yes, intent to make weapons and hatred of America. And now that he's gone... There's no one else in the world who meets that criteria. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? Like this stuff is was making me laugh out loud, which was pretty great. And I found that that's the biggest difference with the Obama era show, which we'll get to in a second, is I thought it was good and I was watching it and I was like, hmm, yes, very good. But <laughs> there was no external laughter. The laughter was happening to like, me in my brain going, aha, mm -hmm, very good. Got his ass. Yes. <laughs> if you want a real blast from the past, you should watch his coverage of the 2000 Republican presidential nominating convention where they're nominating Bush. This was the year where the buzzword was that we are going to be compassionate conservatives. And this is where the Republicans are bragging about diversity, equity, and, and inclusion in 2000s. They were on Team DEI and they had all of the blacks and gays that they could find in the Republican Party were making speeches in the 2000 election. And then something happened and they realized that actually we don't need to do that at all. We can win without doing that. <laughs> One thing that I'd like to point out in this this particular era of Jon Stewart was he started to get conservatives on the show talking to him, mm -hmm. but he also, and this would become a big part of his job during the Obama era, was to debate other conservatives. He kind of became a debate bro of sorts. But in 2004, he went on Crossfire, which was a CNN political back and forth between a bow-tied Tucker Carlson yeah. and a skeleton Paul Begala. And... <laughs> Stewart went on there to, you know, I guess be the, some third member of their spectrum somehow. And he <laughs> was so good at pointing out their bullshit that he got the show canceled, or at least he's credited with getting the show just almost immediately taken off the air after his appearance. That's how mm -hmm. good he was at saying, do you see this? Do you see what you're doing and how stupid this is? And I remember when I saw that getting so much satisfaction, it was like my first taste of owning someone, you know, was <laughs> this yes. instance. And of course, you know, it ruined Tucker's career and he never made a comeback or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that this is where Stewart began to, I think, solidify himself as a really serious, good media figure. And The Daily Show would win like, what, like 30 Emmys in a row every fucking year. Yes, absolutely. And this gets into like his ideology, which is like he claims that the only thing holding America back is that we're not debating the issues good enough. Right. Like Crossfire was a debate show, but he accuses those two guys of being, quote, partisan hacks. So they're 
not really debating. They're just hurling talking points at one another, and they're not doing it good enough. We're going to talk about this when we get to our themes, but this is classic steward ideology. The problem isn't the institutions. The institutions are fine. The problem is the people. And that's, I'm exaggerating a little bit. He does talk about institutional failures at some points, but I don't think he believes in any kind of major structural reform. It's just like, we need better people in media. We need better people in politics, because at the end of the day, people are good, which is a very West Wingy style take. In addition to making fun of the war, the wars, I guess, and the media's <laughs> coverage of it, he was also making fun of the general terror culture that was going on. This I, like, remember the terror index? Oh, he yeah, was, like the weather, the color coded terror weather reports. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like stu- I didn't think he was the on only orange. person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was it any other color than orange? Do you remember it being any other color but orange? That's all I ever remember it seeing. Yeah, it was just orange all the time, which is like great. Uh, what, like, what do you want me to do differently? <laughs> And so he would do stories about how all the New York City landlords were called in to learn how to spot a terrorist who is renting out an apartment from you, right? Which is like, Mm -hmm. of course, one, not going to work and just going to make people racistly rent out their apartments more. (laughs) The pamphlets that the NYPD gave out were like, beware of anyone who like prefers to pay in cash. It's like, that's just all landlords (laughs) you're talking about. (laughs) And yeah, actually building off something Isaac said about the confrontations, like he he had John McCain on his show something like 13 times. At one point, John McCain was the number one most recurring guest as like, you know, whatever, the good conservative that John Stewart liked over Bush. He had a, a formal organized debate with Bill O'Reilly. They loved going on each other's show. And I, I am blending the eras here. But yeah, this is part of how he builds his brand and eventually becomes one of the most trusted men in news, which, you know, he never calls himself a newsman. He always calls himself a comedian. The show that comes on before me is puppets making crank phone calls. That was his defense. I'm just a comedian, right? It's just a bit. But conservatives to this day love him because he also has a bit of a support the troops mentality. Don't support the war, support the troops and definitely support those 9-11 first responders. So he's he's able to like thread this needle perfectly, especially in this era. Yeah. So like Ben just said, he does try to have it both ways a little bit where he's like, I'm a comedian. I don't do real news. But increasingly, once the Obama administration starts, he's starting to sound a lot lot more like regular news. He's Mm -hmm. lecturing the audience on certain topics. He's not going after the president as much in order to go after finer points of politics and media. And so, like I said, I'm watching this Obama era stuff and it's good, but I'm not laughing out loud, but it is very good, partly because the technology has improved. It was really fascinating to learn how the show was made because there's such media heads. They watch so much news all the time that they can just recall clips of when someone said something. Thing. But there are limits to this. Like every time you think you can maybe remember a clip, you have to like send an intern down to get a VHS tape of that day's news and, and try to clip it. But by the time the Obama administration is in full swing, they have the technology where they can just search through the closed captioning logs. And so they can find every time someone said the war on Christmas and put that in a supercut of people saying war on Christmas. And so I think the show can get good in this era, partly because technology has advanced. Yeah. And to give you an idea of what bits look like in this third era, the Obama era. This is also the era where most of the stuff is on YouTube instead of Comedy Central's shitty fucking player. So I watched a clip. They recover the day's news. And this was from 2014. It was about Ferguson, Missouri and the killing of Michael Brown. And it was about Fox News' reaction to a DOJ report. Because the DOJ, when they came in, found out that, you know, hands up, don't shoot. It didn't go down like that. And that was the mantra for the early BLM in 2014. And the DOJ says, we did our investigation. That's not how it happened. It went down slightly differently. And Fox News has a field day, right? A field day of I told you so over this. But John Stewart catches them. They say, "Uh aha, if you would have kept reading the DOJ report, you would have seen that it also said that there were all this structural racism built into policing in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh Aha, you have been owned with flax and logic. But the bit keeps going after that. It's not enough to show this level of hypocrisy because then John Stewart says, let's look at something else Fox News covered like Benghazi and he looks into Fox News's Benghazi coverage and sees that they were going crazy and doing conspiratorial shit before the DOJ report was in and when that DOJ report came in they under reported it so it's like
like, this comedy news bit has been on another media company's reaction to two separate federal government reports and accusing them of hypocrisy and inconsistency in how they do the news. We have lost the fucking script, my man. And don't get me wrong, I watched it. I liked it because uh, it was preaching to the converted. I also think Fox News is bad, but this is not the speaking truth to power into a void that we had in the Bush administration. And I watched not one, not two, but three different 10 minute segments on Ferguson, Missouri and BLM. And it wasn't about anything structural, anything material. It was barely about any government policies. It was about how Fox News reported on it. This era of Jon Stewart is very almost navel gazy into other media apparatus. <laughs> yeah, this is the gotcha hypocrisy era of The Daily Show. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is when it, I think the, the overall cultural landscape flips entirely when Obama gets elected. And Obama's election feels vindicating for, I mean, you guys are Canadian, so you guys can stay out of this conversation. But for us in America, <laughs> Obama getting elected was really like, oh my God, that moral arc that's bending somewhere in the universe, I can see it, but I can see the bend finally. I can see the curvature of that bend. And I think there was this also undeserved sense of satisfaction that liberals had when Obama got elected. And you can, as like a avid Daily Show watcher for years, be like, I'm a part, I did that by watching The Daily Show. I'm a part of that. <laughs> by giving the Nielsen ratings a bump to The Daily Show, I kind of probably helped Obama get elected <laughs> beyond just voting for the guy. So I think that this is where The Daily Show not only becomes this liberal entity, but has to defend Obama because the media landscape shifts so much as well, where you have these Fox News mm -hmm. shows that are basically just kind of like The Daily Show, and they become obsessed instead of with the administration, with the coverage itself of the administration, just like you were pointing out. Yeah, 100%. And what's very funny is that Jon Stewart does start to pull punches on Obama. Like, how many bits did we have about the drone strike program, right? He's kind of running interference for the administration at this point. And yeah, you're totally right. He has to defend it. And what's funny is I remember in this era, there was like a small news cycle where Jon Stewart went to the White House and met with Obama and they had lunch together. And he didn't say it on the show. Fox News dug it out through the visitor logs. They did a little gumshoe reporting of the White House visitor logs and found out that Jon Stewart had been there. And this was Fox News. This was their gotcha moment. I knew you were a liberal. I knew you were a propaganda mouth. And I have the meeting to prove it in the minutes. But when Jon Stewart addressed it on the show, he's like, I didn't say anything to Obama that I haven't said to him when he was in the chair. And he runs a clip of Obama on The Daily Show and them getting into it over something or another. He's like, it was just like that, with, but with the best salmon I've ever had in my life. In that thing, he said that President Obama accused Jon Stewart of making the youth cynical. Like this very tepid criticism that Jon Stewart would occasionally make of Obama. For Obama, with his inflated narcissistic ego, this was too much. He's like, you're, you're making the youth cynical. You don't realize how hard it is to get deals through. Uh, you should be happy that I forced you all to buy insurance after you turned <laughs> Yeah, his complaints about Obama, because I watched all of his Bill O'Reilly appearances, and Bill O'Reilly would be like, admit it, the president is, is a failure. <laughs> And I'm like, yes, John, <laughs> admit it that the president is failure. And John Stewart would be like, um, I think his only failure is that he didn't foresee the level of obstruction that the Republicans would offer. Ugh. His failure was just not being a shrewd enough politician. It's actually the Republicans' fault. And before, it was about communication. I remember he was saying Obama wasn't communicating well enough. Mm -hmm. And so again, it comes yes. to this idea, like you're saying, the debate just wasn't good enough. It's, it's as though we can fix these things through a sincere understanding with each other. And they, they're still saying. <laughs> <laughs> this. There's still op-eds that are like, can Joe Biden convince Americans that the economy is actually good? And it's like, shut the fuck. This is, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the internet word. This is gaslighting. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know the economy is fucked because my wage is low and my rent is high and food is expensive. I don't give a shit about the stock market. Don't tell me that the economy is doing great and employment is high. Like, I can see it with my eyes. <laughs> and yeah, why wouldn't they run this script? It worked so well for Obama, right? <laughs>
Do you remember personally your politics during this era? Did you find yourself, I mean, I found myself defending Obama, looking for reasons to be like, yeah, but, because I mean, I was, you know, mm-hmm. quite, I was in college when he got elected and in New York during his second term. I try to remember what my life was like, what I thought about, what I cared about before Trump got elected. That's when everything changed for me mm-hmm. too. When he first was elected, I was a big contrarian because I do have a bit of a contrarian streak in me. So I remember in like 2009, 2010 or in Obama mania being like, yeah, this guy actually sucks because <laughs> that's kind of my nature. But I remember by like 2011, 12, I started, yeah, I, w- I was parroting the John Stewart talking points. I was like, you know, those dang Republicans, their obstructionism, keeping us from having nice things. The stupid Glenn Beck poisoning everyone's mind with conspiracy theories or whatever the fuck. And then I think the thing that really tipped it for me was was like Syria. Li- what happened to Libya eventually in Syria? Those like foreign policy decisions. I was like, oh, you are also a warmonger. Great. We added another two Middle Eastern countries to the tally of countries we broke. You know, another one. Libya. Another one. Syria. Another one. We can put Yemen in there too, because that's like American funded, even though the Saudis are the ones doing it. Another one. Keep breaking it. I got caught up in Obama mania for sure. 2008, I was rolling. I read Dreams mm-hmm. for My Father. I remember twice. I was like, hell yeah. It, like Google. you said, it was a vindication. America felt pretty bad about itself. And it was this opportunity to pat a medal on our own back and be like, we did it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I voted racism out of existence. Right. What are you talking about? And we were just given <laughs> by the conservative media landscape these villains to like, not just like to call it parody. I think this is the beginning of the death of parody in a lot of ways. But the Tea Party and John Stewart's mission to eradicate them, you know, so instead of examining Obama's policies more clearly, I was caught up in the media dialectical nature going on between like Fox News and really the Daily Show because I didn't watch fucking CNN or nothing like that. Yeah, you're not a boomer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess we'll talk about this a little bit later, but I just become so disappointed in myself looking back on this. <laughs> like how, yes, the same way that the Daily Show was great during the 2000s, my politics were too. They were a lot better. I bought a Dennis Kucinich t-shirt. That's who I was going to, I voted for in the in the primary in, uh, in Florida. Nice. And now he turns out to be a Hell fucking yeah. jerk off too, but whatever. Well, what did he do? Is he a sex pest or something? He jumped on RFK Jr.'s campaign as a consultant of sorts. Oh, hell so yeah, let's go. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> you know? One thing we also should mention before we wrap up this era, the Obama era, this is also where we get the rally to restore sanity <sighs> and or fear. In 2010, Jon Stewart hosted a rally on the National Mall. This rally was called the Rally to Restore Sanity. And then Stephen Colbert, with his even more satirical character, was going to do a follow-up rally called the Rally to Restore or fear, and then they eventually combine them into the rally to restore sanity and or fear. And this thing fucking stunk. I remember almost thinking about renting a car and going because I was like 20, <laughs> 21, driving down to DC from Montreal where I was. That's how Stuart pilled I was at the time. And of course I didn't because I was fucking 20. I had no powers of execution for any goal <laughs> longer than a week. But I remember watching it live, and the only bit that stuck in my brain to this day is that John Stewart had Ozzy. Osborne playing Crazy Train. And then he had Cat Stevens, aka Yusuf Islam, playing Peace Train. And he told Ozzy Osborne, Don't play that train. I want to get on this train. This is his like vaudeville oh, ass variety God. show style joke that he did. And it closed with a speech about how, you know, we got all this partisan gridlock in Washington. And he showed a clip of either the Holland or Lincoln Tunnel, because he's a good Jersey boy, of the cars zipper merging into the tunnel. And it's like Americans can compromise every day. And our cars. Why can't our leaders in Washington do it? And Jon Stewart was rightly mocked at the time from someone like Bill Maher, whom I usually find just (laughs) fucking so irritating. Bill Maher was like, hey, here's an idea. Next time you bring tens of thousands of people together in Washington for a rally, why not make it about something, right? Rather than like a rally for civility's sake. Yeah, like storming the Capitol. That's the best thing. (laughs) Man, I, I can't tell you guys how relieved I was when I found out that Bill Maher isn't Jewish. That was just, (laughs) that made me so happy. I was like, fuck, finally, finally, one of them isn't ours. 
Seth Meyers isn't either, which blew my mind. Another guy who's who's putting on matzo face. Yeah, I, I guess the moral of this era is you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Yeah. Which is what happened to Jay Stewart. Exactly. He became just a media personality. But yeah, you, you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And so in the 2000s, he's describing the ideology of the show as taking last night's news, digesting it and presenting you a turd. And now the ideology of the show is to speak truth. This is from the oral history that they're saying about their own show, Stewart had become the nation's fact checker. The showrunner read seven newspapers a day to make sure the info was right. John Stewart has become Jeff Newsroom. And the <laughs> attitude that they have is to keep the administration in check and no longer to present you with a turd. And so you're you're laughing out loud less, but he's making a lot of really salient points. Mm -hmm. And then one last little bit about the era that I want to mention is in all of the O'Reilly debates and in the Chris Wallace interview, I noticed that John Stewart was obsessed with the idea of presenting news without bias. So that was his gotcha mm -hmm. moment on O'Reilly is like, you appear on a news channel and you have a point of view that's politically biased. Gotcha. You do the news and you have a political point of view. And Bill O'Reilly would be like, well, you're a shill for the left. And he's like, no, I'm not. I give it to them straight. And uh, I rip on Obama when I need to. A lot of Remember Shuffle is about talking about the culture of the era. And I think that that's one big difference compared to today is for boomers who grew up watching Walter Cronkite when there was only like three channels. So they couldn't really be biased because everybody's watching the same three channels. And the idea that you would have someone who didn't have a political bent was extremely important to them. And they're obsessed with that idea. And I think that people have abandoned that, maybe rightly so. I don't know that I need the news to be unbiased. Like now we have a news system that's so fragmented that I have Chapo, which is the perfect tone mm -hmm. and voice for me personally. And like, I don't want to watch a news source yeah. without a political yeah, leaning no because that sounds boring. Like true objectivity. Unless we're like measuring particles or whatever the fuck. Not even. So, for sure. so why bother pretending? Not even. There's like uh, the Heisenberg, whatever. You guys are scientists, you know. As a, as a journalist, I'll tell you, and it's dawned on me while I was working for the New York Times, even the quotes that I choose to pick render the entire story subjective. So mm -hmm. it is disappointing, I think, mm. that, and, and today in particular, is people are not media savvy. They continue to not be media savvy. I don't want to get mm -hmm. into the Israel-Palestine thing, but this might be like a sea change in, in media savviness. I think it might have broken people's brains. And now they're actually starting to understand how the news works a little bit better. Better, but that might be for a whole other subject time. Yeah, yeah. So finally, we'll move on to, I think, what'll be the funnest section of the show, which is talking about the Daily Show since Jon Stewart left. The dog shit era. The dog shit era. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, they changed the song, too. Did they really? Yeah. The intro song, they hip-hopped it up. <laughs> oh. We're, we're going to get into this. I've been watching a lot. Oh, my God. I, I watched a little bit of the old stuff, but I watched a lot of the new stuff. And holy fuck, dude. It's yeah. so bad. Just speaking generally about why it's bad, I mean, one of the things that I hate is that they've dropped the pretense of doing satire a lot. We'll play some clips later when we actually focus on satire as a theme. But it used to be that the correspondence would take the bad position and actually try to shill for something horrible. But now it's like the correspondents do field pieces where they're just supportive of the lib causes that they're covering. Or Jordan Klepper will just go out there and argue with Trump supporters. If I wanted to see this, I would call my uncle. I don't need to watch The Daily <laughs> Show to see th this, and it's not going to change anything. And then the other thing that they do is they do stories that just run parallel to CNN. So they're not even making fun of the news. I have some examples here, and for anybody who accuses me of cherry picking, I just have this to say that I have a full-time job. I don't have time to sift through dozens of hours of Trevor Noah clips. These are the, literally the first clips that I found. I promise you. So first thing I throw on, because we're doing an episode on Pat Tillman. I'm like, let me look up Trevor Noah, Afghanistan. So he does an episode on Afghanistan. And the whole story is about how the U.S. government painted a rosier picture of the war in Afghanistan during the 2000s than was actually happening. Oh, no, they lied? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, <laughs> this news, quote unquote, is 20 20 years old, right? <laughs> no shit, dude. That's what the government is supposed to do. Like, what kind of government do you think is going to be pessimistic about the war? Second of all, Trevor Noah keeps cutting to clips from CNN and Fox. And the stories that Fox and CNN are doing are 
about how the government painted a rosier picture of Afghanistan. And so the point that CNN and Fox are trying to make is this issue with the government not being credible. And that's also Trevor Noah's point. And so his point isn't running tangential or opposite of the CNN or Fox news stories. It's running parallel to the CNN and Fox news stories. And it's like, well, why why don't I just fucking watch CNN if you're going to show me clips of CNN and then agree with them? <laughs> yeah, wild. <laughs> yeah. So here's here's a couple of <laughs> clips from Trevor Noah eviscerating the, the U.S. government. Let's see what I got here. Oh, they every detail about the war in Afghanistan. They used numbers they couldn't back up. They hyped small successes when they knew the big picture was getting worse. And they even tried to spin suicide bombings as a sign of success, which is confidence, if nothing else. You know, it's like making a Tinder profile that says, you know I'm a catch because I have my own room in my mommy's basement. Swipe right. What do you guys think of that cutting criticism? What the fuck? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, How bad is that? That's the first clip I watched. I swear, to, I swear to Yahweh, first clip I fucking watched <laughs> was, sw- was a fucking kinder swipe right joke. God, he's Brutal. horrible. With a little basement thrown in there, a little basement spice yeah, joke. The joke is that, oh, I like the confidence that the U.S. had in their assessment of the war. It's like a guy who says, I live with my parents, but I'm open about it and confident about it. Like, what the fuck? I, it's... It's, it's reaction video stuff. I mean, this is this is all it is. Is it's re, they're not. Ma- you're right. You're not, they're not making news, and it's not even an analysis. It's fucking XQC going. Oh my god, do you see this chat? Do you see this? It's unbelievable that this is like million dollars doing this shit. Oh yeah, they have a room full of writers to have the punchline swipe right, which has literally been a hack way of doing stand up comedy since 2014. <laughs> it is insane. I don't care if you're on four nights a week. This this room probably has 12 writers. I think ChatGPT could write a better punchline than this. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it in post. <laughs> let's, let's see if we can get the robot to write something better than what Trevor Noah did. Uh, okay, this is the same clip continued. Now, it's not unusual for governments to try and make things seem like they're going well in the war when they aren't. But what makes the story even more egregious was that they lied about even having a plan. It's as blunt as can be. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know exactly why we were there or how we could get out, and not a soul could define victory. Retired General Douglas Loot, the Afghan war czar. Anyway, so the point of that is just to say he's just playing clips of CNN that agree with him. Why would I not just watch Fox if I wanted to get this story? The tangential satire approach to this story would be to be like, look how stupid CNN is for reporting that the government lied about the war in Afghanistan. No shit. The government, that's what the government is supposed to do. They're supposed to lie about the war. Oh, yeah. You mean the thing that we like catastrophically lost on TV that was projected (laughs) globally? You're telling me we weren't getting the straight truth over the past 20 years? Yeah. And this is news? News alert. We. (laughs) Okay. So I wanted to talk about some of the we got them culture of the Trump era. Everybody thought that they were really making good points about Trump and that they had finally found the contradiction which would convince his supporters that he was not a man of integrity and honor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Donald Trump discussing the wall, the, the, the Mexican wall. I said, do they all have wheels? Yes. Oh, I thought it was medieval. The wheel is older than the wall. You know that? And... Uh, There are some things that work. You know what? A wheel works and a wall works. You know, if if a football player got up after a tackle and started talking like that, the trainer would be like, "Uh, we need to get you to the locker room now. Your brain is not okay. And just by the way, I don't even, I can't believe we have to say this. If there are any kids watching that are gonna use this on a history test, walls are actually much older than the wheel. (laughs) right? 6,000 years older than the wheel. So fucking true. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. (laughs) Yeah, that sucks. Donald Trump did not know that walls are older than the wheel. Checkmate. Cheeto Voldemort needs to brush up on his ancient Mesopotamian urbanism history. (laughs) 
Oh, uh, every time that Trevor Noah would play a clip of Trump, because the John Stewart formula is to like play a clip of Bush and then do analysis and exaggeration. The problem with doing that for Trump is that every time Trevor Noah puts Trump on the screen, I want him to leave Trump there because Trump is <laughs> way more entertaining and his exaggerations of his own personality are so much better than anything you could mock or lampoon. Yeah. And Trump has charisma. <laughs> <laughs> it is trying to put a hat on a hat. Trump is already a hundred times funnier than whatever exaggeration your writers are going to come up with. Yeah. I was like, leave Trump on the screen. This guy's so much more entertaining. Yeah. His bit there was like, oh, Trump said Mexico was going to pay for the wall. Um, so maybe he'll go down there for Taco Tuesday because that's his way of honoring the culture. <laughs> <laughs> brutal brutal stuff <laughs> yeah also you want to talk about a guy with bad politics you should look up trevor noah's stand-up comedy bit from when he's in south africa and he has a brave pro cop anti-striking minor bit where we get some cops gunned down some striking minors in south africa and then this was news everyone was talking about it did the cops handle it poorly they don't report the news well it's sensationalism and everyone knows what should have been done you know people on the radio people on the news yeah you know these bloody police these bloody police have gotten out of hand they're busy shooting people and they you know why didn't they use rubber bullets why didn't they use rubber bullets and tear gas because those things don't work anymore they had to come with ammunition because those guys had weapons plus tear gas is a waste of time which strike has ever ended because of tear gas where have you ever heard that on the news and after the police deployed the tear gas everybody went home no it doesn't <laughs> It doesn't happen. Tear gas has just become part of a strike now. It's like a little smoke machine. It's just like, you know, adds ambiance to the atmosphere. It's just, you know, you're wasting your time with tear gas, man. Everyone has ideas what the police should have done. You hear them on 702. You know, the sad thing is they didn't even warn the miners first. Why didn't they warn them? Uh, when someone has a gun pointed at you like this, is that not a warning anymore? <laughs> My favorite was the National Union of Mine Workers. They said, uh, what, what is the worst thing in this circumstance is that the police did not even ask the miners what they wanted. They, before they should, they should have asked them, what did they want? <laughs> At what point <laughs> do you ask these people? <laughs> It's not good, folks. It's real bad, in fact. <laughs> he did just kind of come out of the blue. I think he became a correspondent during the Stewart era. And from what I remember, they were actually trying to get Michael Che to take over for John. Mm. And Che up and took the SNL job instead. And I think Samantha B, one of the longtime Daily Show correspondents, felt very betrayed that mm. she wasn't selected to take over for John. Because this was also leading up to our first female president. And that would make <laughs> sense to have the first female <laughs> daily show host at the same time but right. it didn't work either way turns out but she got her own show on like tbs though. she did and yeah. it is a bad one <laughs> yeah. it is so bad oh my god i had a brief trump derangement syndrome infection in like 2016 where i was way too keyed in and i was watching a lot of samantha b it is not good i remember she did a show with glenn beck where a reformed glenn beck it was yes. when glenn beck thought that the he read the tea leaves to be an anti anti-Trump conservative, a never-Trumper. Mm -hmm. And they wore, like, Christmas sweaters together. Mm -hmm. And she was like, see, we can be friends. We can take down the big bad guy <laughs> together. And then, of course, Glenn Beck turns around again and is just like, actually, trans people don't exist. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so pathetic. Yeah, no, I remember that exact bit because they had a cake made. It was a pun on strange bedfellows where, like, both of them were made out of fucking marzipan or whatever. And it was like marzipan, some Samantha B and Glenn Beck in bed together, but they each had one foot out of the bed so they could be ready to run because they're strange bedfellows, but they both hate the orange man bad, the never Trump conservative and Samantha B the lib. That's the kind of comedy you'd get from the Samantha B, whatever her show was called. <laughs> what was it called? Something about hives or bees, I think. I think there was probably a bee pun in there. The honeycomb, Samantha B. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it was interesting in the oral history to hear about the people they were considering to take over The Daily Show. Because John's first choice, but then her career blew up and they weren't able to get her, thank God. But the first person he thought of was actually Amy Schumer. <laughs> What a fucking dog shit show that would have been. I can't think of anyone who's less political in her act at all. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that, like, she's probably had the worst politics in the world over the last three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We would have had some brave uh, segments from uh, Amy Schumer. 
um, if she was the host of the Daily Show today. Anything else to say about Trevor Noah and the guest uh, era? Like the, I know he's been having a bunch of guest hosts in the last year. Well, he officially retired almost a year ago, ten months ago, I think. And since then, they've had these rotating guests on, and that's what I've been watching a lot of. You know, you had Chelsea Handler, Jesus Miro, Leslie Jones. I watched a few of her episodes, and I gotta say, obviously, mostly white people watch this show, but the new show is very much like a giving white people the sense that they're invited to the barbecue <laughs> because like <laughs> it is unbelievable and and like all the cor- the white correspondents do the snl thing where they're just like a, a whiny little white person and then you know, have like sort of like oh you dumb wh- white person it's so <laughs> bad it's so incredibly bad i can't imagine anyone watching the show in the first place but it's so clearly for white people to feel like they're with it yes. and poor leslie jones having to play this character it's really embarrassing and they're really bad at it too like chelsea handler cannot deliver a line to save her life i mean it is it is awful awful tv and yet why they have to continue to make it is beyond me (laughs) like what why not just stop if you're going to abandon the format of the show entirely then yeah why continue money i guess yeah they've killed the brand right the daily show is dead there's a thought experiment from the world of philosophy called theseus's ship the idea is that theseus had a ship and the athenians like had it up somewhere they thought oh this is our boy theseus the king's ship and every now and then a plank would rot and so they take out the rotted plank and they replace it with a new plank and you run this back for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and the philosophical question is like is this thing that has had each part replaced individually is it still theseus's ship Hmm. the answer for the daily show is like obviously not it is not satirical anymore no one from the daily show with don stewart is still on it to my knowledge it just isn't what it is anymore it's something else entirely i just remember they had a bit and i use that very loosely kind of like giordano said about running in parallel i think it was the correspondent i'm gonna i don't want to do a racism let me make sure i get her name right i think it was <laughs> dulce sloan is her name dulce sloan had a bit that was just about like a black beauty standards or something like that and it's like there weren't any jokes again just repeating bits of other long-form journalism about black beauty standards or whatever and that's fine like i'm not saying that i'm not saying that this is bad for the record if this is what you want to watch but it's not what the daily show was right which was like an absurdist postmodern take on a cable news show and i have one thing i, I want to say like on this like diversity topic and i'm i might cut it out because <laughs> it's it's a bit raw we're on thin ice already <laughs> yeah so canada and the united states have always had two different visions of multiculturalism in theory right canada has preached what's called like a cultural mosaic it's this idea that every culture is a distinctive part of a, a larger picture within the society and the united states is has like a melting pot ideology this idea that everybody's culture gets blended into like one solution and i was just wondering let's say we had a hundred shows would the ideal for a society be that every single show has one person from each culture working on the show or is it that we have six shows that are written by Jewish guys who went to Harvard and like six shows that are only written by women who went to Stanford and like <laughs> six shows written by Catholics or is it better that they're all like is spread out amongst every show? I don't like I, I'm, I'm going to be a I'm just asking questions guy <laughs> on this episode. <laughs> and I don't know because on one hand, I love the early Daily Show written by six Jewish guys who went to Harvard. And that being said, it also means the show has some weaknesses because they have blind spots to certain things. And I think the best example example of this was right after Hurricane Katrina. This is in the in the oral history. This is when they say that Jon Stewart became the voice of reason during the Bush years. This was like one of the first times that he was serious and spoke directly to the camera and said, Mr. President, sir, you have failed us. And like, it wasn't jokey. It was like luxury and serious. And, and the people in the book said that this was a really important tone change for Jon Stewart. And I went and watched that clip of him speaking to Bush about Katrina. And he does break the seriousness with a joke. And this is the joke that he made, right? So he says, when Bill Clinton had the Lewinsky affair, that we were failing from a lack of leadership. And during Hurricane Katrina, we are now failing again due to a lack of leadership. The only difference is that we don't have 200,000 people stranded in Monica Lewinsky's vagina, or as a 
it's also known the Superdome, or as it's also known the Big Easy. Oh. And it's like, oh God, yeah, we're gonna break this lecture to the president by being like, oh yeah, remember when Monica Lewinsky was a slut? It was seven years ago. It was seven years ago, and she was like, <laughs> she has said like I was coerced by literally mm-hmm. the stro- like the most powerful man on the planet. Like, is this the right time or person to dunk on when mm-hmm. in a in a message about Katrina to say, yeah, she was a slut. Remember that? Yeah. And also, and, super dome. Make a blowjob joke. Exactly. No, no don't. <laughs> It's it's right there. Yeah, it was right there. Don't you don't have to say call her the big easy. Yes, I like that this show was so fucked up. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, I just think how fuck she's like twenty years yeah. old, right? She was a child, basically. <laughs> oh fuck. It is so fucked uh, up. And so I was thinking like the show is written by six Jewish guys who went to Harvard, you know, <laughs> future Alan Dershowitz is no no no. <laughs> This is the type of weaknesses that the show might have on the topic of diversity in the writer's room. All right. So, yeah, that's the rise and fall of The Daily Show. If you still watch it and think it's good, please reach out. I want to know who you are. Please seek help, dude. I I had a lot of people get mad at me. I don't know. Hemi, my my good friend who's Ethiopian, she's like, don't rip on Trevor Noah. I would never like rip on a fellow African person. And I was like, you're Ethiopian. He's from South Africa. Those countries couldn't be farther apart. It's... It's like someone from Thailand standing up for an Iranian or something. So there, he does have stands. Ah. Ben, you love his book, right? Like, you I think he like is a good book. comedian. It's just the show is bad. Yeah, the show is bad. I got some laughs out of the book. I listened to it on Audible, and, so, and he reads it, and he does the voices. But he essentially was like six years old, I think, when apartheid ended. So he described his earliest childhood memories in like the dying era of this system, and then growing up in the transition out of it. And I don't know, if you're interested in South Africa, and the anti-apartheid struggle and what that's like. It's a really interesting memoir. I do think that probably most of the people, even the writers, are talented. I mean, Trevor Noah, talented comic. They suffer from the same problem that SNL suffers from in a lot of ways. When I was in New York recently, I saw Sarah Sherman do some stand-up and she was fucking incredible. She's awesome. I've seen her twice. I was was crying. I was crying, laughing so hard. And she's also, turns out to be one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Total sweetheart. And then you see her on SNL and you're like, damn, I know you're a funny person, but this is really hard to watch. Like, why is it so impossible to be funny under these circumstances? So I I wonder if The Daily Show suffers from the same sort of issue. And I guess we can get into that talking about the state of satire today. Let's move on to the themes section of the show. So we're going to talk about satire and class politics here. So first off, we'll talk about satire, which has always been one of my favorite art forms. This idea of taking on the position you hate and taking it to its extreme or parodying it, I've always had a very big soft spot for something like The Onion. And Stephen Colbert, one one issue that I think the show has is Stephen Colbert says when he was doing these early segments in the first eight years of the show, he would tell new correspondents, when you do this job, you need to take your soul off and put it on a wire hanger and leave it in the closet before you get on the plane to do one of these pieces. Because you don't want your behavior during these segments to affect your soul. And I think what he was saying is you have to be a bad person and you have to be okay Mm -hmm. with antagonizing people and generally being a bad person because it's satirical. You have to be the bad guy. And I don't think that the modern correspondents are willing to be the bad guy. The original correspondents, they can allow the person being interviewed to make the jokes. There's this famous series that Samantha Bee did. She was covering gay penguins at Central Park. And she sets the guy up by saying a line, just because it occurs in nature doesn't mean it's natural. And, uh, you know, the zookeeper can can point out that she's wrong. But I want to play a little clip from a fracking it from today's daily show of Desi Lydic, who did a correspondence piece on fracking next to a grade school. Wow, that's fracked. Colorado, I love how chill you are, but with this, you're being way too chill. This is a huge problem. So I sat down with Tim Eastup, a lawyer who's suing the state for exposing students to such a clear health risk. Living near a fracking site has been correlated with nosebleeds, mm. headaches, mm. asthma, low birth weight, congenital heart defects, cancer, leukemia. It it can be overwhelming. 
So Desi Lytic is taking on the point of view of the person she's interviewing, that it's bad and we should stop this. And at this point, it's like, oh, you've just become 60 Minutes. There's no satire here. There's no attempt to take on the other point of view to show how ridiculous it is. Yeah, and the satire would be great. It writes itself. Hey, you know, a few nosebleeds as a kid is good for you. It clears out the sinuses, right? Just like earnestly, genuinely do this. And what's hilarious is that some fracking proponents do this. Like real article heads in New newsies will remember that john hickenlooper drank fracking oil on the fucking floor of the house of representatives i think it was or maybe it was the colorado state house i forget but he's like fracking is natural it comes from the earth glug 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 to like the water that they use to separate the oil from the fucking sand or whatever yeah how can you not make fun of that how do you why just talk to a public health expert on your comedy news program and be like yes listen to this public health expert and then you turn to the camera and say yeah that's bad I think we've entered this era of satire where you can't be ambiguous. You have yes. to be so clearly on one side or another, and you cannot be confused for the other. I don't know if that's fear of being canceled or whatever, but yeah, you're right. That's what was so fun about Stephen Colbert and the, the old correspondents, the way they did things. They embodied these awful characters and they got to point out absurdity. But I think that because the world is so absurd, maybe they're trying to lessen it. They don't want to add more absurdity to it. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, nobody wants to appear to be problematic, even if it's on a satire show. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think in the 2000s, we love this kind of shit of like putting someone on camera and making them squirm, right? Like I see a lot of overlap between early Daily Show correspondent pieces and something like the Ali G show and all the Sasha Baron Cohen things. And I think we've gotten away from it because sometimes it can feel, whether or not it's true it can feel like you are punching down to use the word from the twitter right but the daily show was so brilliant because they frequently got really powerful people i think the best john oliver segment from the entire daily show is his gun control bit because he talks to the fucking prime minister of australia and he parrots right-wing pro-gun talking points at him so he asks the prime minister of australia how does it feel to have failed so colossally on gun control it's actual satire and And it's it's not breaking character either Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's punching up instead of down or whatever. But yeah, he's willing to embody the problematic statement and not be winking at the audience like, just so you know, just so you know, I know that this is wrong. Just not like Colbert and Carell would, where they were like, stone face, well, I'm a a gun advocate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I have these clips from Clever. Clever will just go to Trump rallies and interview Trump supporters and argue with them. (laughs) The Trump supporters are like, oh, yeah, did you hear about Hunter Biden's laptop? It had a bunch of shady stuff on it. And Clever's like, well, uh, Hunter Biden isn't the president. So uh, I don't know why that would be relevant. Like the, the Hunter Biden scandal. What exactly happened with that? I think they, they found a laptop that had, you know, emails. Who did? In, um, Who was the FBI? They found a laptop right. with like emails and pictures of, you know, Biden talking with like Ukraine and China about business deals and stuff like that. And Which was, Biden? Uh, Hunter Biden. Then did something happen? They want to push it to get it, you know, get the investigation underway before the election. Yeah. But what's the investigation of? About laptop. just the laptop and just what was on it. What was Not on the laptop? I mean, conspiracy theorists would say that it's Joe Biden and Hunter Biden communicating with, you know, outside countries on business deals and stuff like that. Are you calling him a conspiracy theorist? That's (laughs) just what he said. Because only because it hasn't been proven yet. And it's like, dude, do you not understand, like, how funny Hunter Biden is as a figure and, like, how weird it is that he's the president's (laughs) son? Like, stop being a shill for the Biden administration. It's like being a a, a shill for the Gerald Ford administration, dude. Like, (laughs) what? Like, how radical are your politics? And and man on the street bullshit is punching down. (laughs) Yeah. In in this this particular format where you are interviewing someone who is not skilled in this department whatsoever. Because ever see like the 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 Fresh and Fit or like the whatever podcast, those like super misogynist things where they have like girls who have OnlyFans come on and they're just like, how can you be such a dumb bitch? And (laughs) Yeah. Just terrorize these poor women and just with that sort of guy Andrew Tate logic about evolutionary like benefits of cheating or whatever. You know, yeah, it's like yeah. I mm-hmm. it's 
the same thing. It's no better. Yeah, you yeah. great. You found the person at the Trump rally with the most Aspergers, and you're going to own him with facts and logic. <laughs> Congrats, <laughs> dude. Yeah. Okay, so one more thing I'll say about satire is big format of the show I thought that made it really strong was the way that John Stewart would use Socratic irony to make his points. So he would intentionally pretend to not understand the issue at all and then be purely informed by the news clips he was playing. And so be like, okay, so and then like following the logic and being like, okay, I don't mm-hmm. understand how this works. And then you play a clip from Fox News and be like, oh, okay, so the Bush administration was trying to understand this. But yeah, I thought it was a very effective, or at least for comedy, format of working through issues is to be like, okay, I'm a blank slate and then letting different clips contradict each other. Let's move on to the class politics. Yeah. The short version is there aren't any really. We've said this already in the Obama era is because John Stewart thinks Obama can't get his agenda passed because he's just not astute enough. And those dastardly Republicans aren't debating in good faith. They're not compromising enough, like he said, in the rally to restore sanity and or fear. And what John Stewart being a good lib just doesn't get is class interests are real and they are a zero sum game. So in order for the larger of the two classes, the working class to win, the capitalist class has to lose, right? In order for all of Americans to get health care, some Americans health care is going to get worse. There is no compromise between one group of people that wants wages to be as high as possible because they sell their labor to survive and another group that wants wages to be as low as possible because they buy it to make money without working, right? This class lens never crops up on the show. Ideologically, in terms of the theory, you can see it in his rally to restore sanity and or fear. Can't we all just zipper merge into the tunnel? Why can't these two camps zipper merge into bipartisan legislation? And in praxis, we of course have the writer's strike of 2007. So yeah, in 2006, they're starting to put clips online and people are starting to make money off of these shows being on the internet, which is not in writer's contracts. They aren't making any residual money from this. And so the writers threaten to strike and say, hey, we need money from the internet revenue as well. Like that's part of how you make money. And so it should be how a part of how we make money. And we've just won two Emmys in a row. And we have people who have families who don't have health insurance. So we would like to form a union. And Jon Stewart says that it was a betrayal of trust and that he was very sad. And I took it very personally that my writers wanted to unionize. And it's like, motherfucker, you weren't taking it personally when your writer's families didn't have health insurance. That part you don't take personally. I'm about to own mm-hmm. John Stewart with facts and logic, but <laughs> <laughs> this idea that you could have a liberal show where the owner was against his own writers unionizing is, I think, indicative of the class politics of the show that he expected to just be this benevolent patriarch that would give his writers the right amount of pay when that's not what was happening. They were underinsured. And so the writers say that eventually he did change his mind and was supportive of the union, but he wasn't at first. And then, you know, it's like the Iraq war. It's really not relevant what you eventually move to because when we need your support was like during the strike. And mm-hmm. John Stewart says in the book, okay, hey, you know, I felt like the bad guy. And it's like, well, yeah, you were the bad guy, actually. Like maybe your Emmy award winning writers who make the show what it is should have health insurance. Then John Stewart, during the writer's strike in 2010, he actually, he uses, like, he gets an advance for the book to pay the writers so that they have some money during the strike. And he's all butthurt after the strike because he says that nobody gave him any acknowledgement. No one said thank you for getting you money during the strike. And I just feel like this is like a real, like, reverse Don Draper moment. You know, like, that's what the work is for. I think that the oral history is a, a great glimpse into the absence of politics in these people. Mm-hmm. Because the book was, well, it was, again, published and written up before Trump's election. So they didn't realize that history wasn't, you know, linear at the time. And it's so fascinating to see their obsession with their career. Like, it's yeah. all about the form of the show and, and not the political milieu around it. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be really, really glaring. And there were these moments in the book where when they're covering the initial 2000 election, one of the producers says, uh, the problem with the Democratic convention was there was no evil. (laughs) And you're like, what the fuck? Like, and to be saying it at that point, like at at that juncture, I think is very telling. And this is where I think all comedians are evil. I I have a a very hot take on comedy now and how it might not be good for us as a a means of politics. And I think The Daily Show shows precisely that. Just because you had 
had the facts and logic or you were owning them or pointing out hypocrisy, that was enough. You know, mm-hmm. just being right and being better than the other side was enough for them. And of course, post Bush, all media mutated into that. I mean, all media is daily show now, practically. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that what we see now, and I think one of the things I find most frustrating, I used to say that journalists were the, the most annoying people on earth, but now I think it's it's comedians mm-hmm. because they see themselves as the ultimate truth tellers. And that just isn't the case. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think the thing that people miss is like making your comedy program, your political comedy program and consuming your political comedy program is not political action, right? Keeping people informed is like, if it is an action, it's like the first step. If politics is meant to be about power, who has it, who wields it and how, then yeah, your little show is not really doing politics fundamentally. Doing politics is being on a podcast and talking about the Daily Show (laughs) and their lack of politics. Yeah, Yeah, for the record, I do not think I am doing politics. Yeah, patting myself real hard on the back. I am very much against our writers unionizing. They have tried it before and I told them, I will close up shop so fast your head will spin. All right, let's move on to limit of civility. Go off, Ben. Right, yeah. So I think Jon Stewart, one thing that's unique about him is that even conservatives loved him, or if not loved him, respected him, because they saw him as like mostly honest, mostly noble. He had conservatives on, but he hits a wall, because at the end of the day, he's on a cable news network. Yeah, he swears. Yeah, he makes dick jokes, but he needs to be acceptable in polite company. He has a financial interest in doing so, because he could get his ass fired if he's like too much of a dirtbag. And I think also, like, he does genuinely believe this. Like, ideologically, he believes in some level of civility because he believes in communication and compromise and all that good shit that we've been talking about in terms of his ideology. He, of course, can be confrontational. And he's what's impressive that he's super competent when he's confrontational. Like, he cancels Crossfire. The Bill O'Reilly debates are also fun to watch. He easily handles that fucking blowhard sex pest Bill O'Reilly in their debates. But he just hits, he has a ceiling. He has a ceiling that comes from civility but i'd recommend everyone watch his interview with judith miller it's 11 minutes this woman who she's not single-handedly responsible for the new york times endorsing iraq but she's pretty close she was like part of a Pulitzer surprise winning journalism team she had a piece that was on the front page next to a 9-11 mural that was talking about iraqi wmds <laughs> that just reprinted like not corroborated stuff and then the retraction was on page 18 another day and john stewart he does his socratic method where he's starts with the question, why did we go to Afghanistan? And she says, 9-11. And he says, why did we go to Iraq? And she says, 9-11. It says, okay, well, that didn't happen organically. Something had to happen to shift the spotlight from Afghanistan to Iraq. And that was the media. And they go step by step. And I showed it to Adriano. They get into minutia, but he can't just curse this woman out on TV. He can't call her a liar. He can't call her a war criminal or a ghoul or whatever. He has to just close. It is like very much like a Plato dialogue where he he closes by just kind of throwing up his hands and say, agree to disagree. He says, I always find these interviews sad because no one can take responsibility. They just packed the buck. That's like as much as he can do. But he's still like, he says, thanks for coming on the show because she knows he hates her and has ripped into her, but he still shakes her hand or whatever. Yeah. At the end of the day, he still has to be civil. And there are just some limits to how you can, I think, you know, ideologically, there are some limits as to how much truth to power you can speak while maintaining civility. There's a reason that dirtbag left pods are so fucking popular. People need to hear these monsters be called out for who and what they are. Yeah, I think that you're right, by and large. I think that his politics of civility platformed people beyond their sincerity. I think John McCain is a perfect example of someone who is a fucking ghoul. Mm -hmm. But Jon Stewart humanized him so much. I mean, he made him look really good because John McCain knew how to play that game, too, initially, Mm -hmm. until I think they finally had a falling out. I do believe in killing him with kindness. As a journalist, that tends to be the best way to get stuff out. Let them hang themselves. But you don't get that much rope as a journalist in such a, a short platform or, or like structure that The Daily Show had. Yeah. Is that enough? Is it enough just to kind of prove them wrong Socratically? I no, Definitely Yeah. And not. I think that should be the virtue of being a comedian. You're totally right. Yeah. If you're a journalist, there are libel and slander laws or whatever, right? For a reason. If you're an actual journalist, yeah, that's a great approach. Let them hang themselves. Let them do whatever. But if you're a comedian on the comedy network and you got Judith fucking Miller on your program. He should have thrown a pie (laughs) in her face. You should. (laughs) 
Judith Miller is currently making PragerU videos. She doesn't have an ounce <laughs> of introspection in her. Judith Miller, in the year of our Lord, fucking 2023, is coming out with videos that's like, you know, being wrong isn't the same as lying. And, you know, we did an oopsie with that, you know, Iraq war intelligence. It's like, duh! So you should have killed her, is what you're saying. <laughs> that's, the real, that's the real policy. You should have shot her on air. <laughs> I'm not advocating any no. violence ex- other than the pie in the face. Okay, that's okay. a good. That, that would have been other than the pie in the face. Maybe some kind of <laughs> bottle of seltzer water. Maybe some kind of like a flower that sprays water or something. Something. All right. We'll quickly go over some of the echoes in the culture. So how has this show changed culture? We've talked a lot about how all of late night now resembles this format, and uh, it's bad now because everybody is in fact seeing this shit. Even like Jimmy Fallon, who normally would do like Wheel of Music impressions is now doing <laughs> bits about Betsy DeVos during the Trump era and stuff like that. So definitely had a huge impact on culture. But I think like Ben Shapiro to a certain extent is trying to do a conservative daily show. And the correspondence on the show, this was also like a farm team for comedic talent. This is how we get a lot of the names that are mainstays now of like the political media world. The guys like Stephen Colbert, like Hassan Minaj, like John Oliver. They're all from the daily show. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to in conclusion. In conclusion, what has this episode been about? This episode has been about this, are you seeing this shit that Jon Stewart was able to do so well? And I was uh, looking through the, the Chapo Trap House Discord, and I found someone saying that they became a big fan after the 2016 election when SNL was playing the Hallelujah cover by Kate McKinnon. They turned on Chapo, and <laughs> Felix opened the episode by saying, I may not be Dale Earnhardt, but I crashed into the fucking wall because I couldn't turn left. And someone who is willing to come out and say the truth and not be a fucking glib was very valuable. And it's something that The Daily Show lost as it got bigger and that it seems like we always need to look to like new shows to turn against the popular narrative. And new media. Yeah. I think the biggest spiritual successor, like, yes, every late night host is a photocopy of a photocopy. Jimmy Fallon, that fucking toady or like Jimmy Kimmel, who used to do blackface on The Man Show, is now out there weeping and telling us to call our representatives after every mass shooting now it's all like this grotesque photocopy of a photocopy or, or or the broken cloning machine from aliens 4 of just these late night shows just begging us to kill them because they are not really the postmodern meta parody of news. They still have a little bit of that late night DNA, but they're trying to be political and they're not very good at it. That's one way that the, the Daily Show went. I think like the biggest spiritual successor is probably John Oliver's Last Week Tonight, but it is fundamentally different. It does these like 25 minute long pieces with a team of HBO researchers. And I think it's not trying to be a parody of something. It is just kind of its own own thing. And I think that's, I mean, I've talked about John Oliver on this show before about my like mixed feelings about him, but I think he's of all of these dumpster fire desk comics. I think he's the best. Yeah, he they, they does a good job, but I, I'd argue that the spiritual successor to The Daily Show is Chapo Trap House. I think that they do for me now what The Daily Show did then. Mm. And I think that they also are prey to the same criticism of like, is this, is this politics? Their politics are good. I mostly agree agree with them on things but what is it doing what kind of call to action does listening to a podcast actually accomplish it does make me feel a sense of satisfaction being like ha i know better than you Mm -hmm. do now Mm -hmm. and so are we going to look back on chapo trap house the same way we look back on the daily show and i think that chapo trap house is a lot more self-aware about that i think that they know that they Mm -hmm. are like that and matt chrisman on his stream talks about that all the time he's like he's like i'm not this doesn't do anything like I'm not. Mm-hmm. I'm not helping at all. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. No. I think that's a, that's an excellent take. They fill that same niche for good and for ill of offering some kind of catharsis to the. Are you seeing this moment that we live in? So yeah, that's that's our episode on the Daily Show. And I would just like to say that you should definitely give a follow to Isaac on Instagram at Gluten Daddy. He's a very funny Instagram account. He um, he also <laughs> has a podcast called Cheeseburger in Babylon. I highly recommend his pickleball episode. He's he's a pickleball hater on the record. And any specific episodes that you think the Daily Show fan might be into? The the one where I interview a guy who had sex with a dolphin. <laughs> that sounds like a, uh, a leather jacket era segment of the uh, the Daily Show. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, they had a cigarette with the, the dolphin <laughs> after the fact. <laughs> 
yeah, no, please get a listen. I want to have you guys on because Florida in the 2000s, I think, is one of the most pivotal eras in uh, American history. We had the election. We had 9-11. I was at the school the day that I was there when George Bush had the, that guy whisper in his ear that the second oh. plane hit the town. That was my school. I was there. Really? Wow. Uh, right. Florida is the vanguard of the 21st century of America. <laughs> so I want to have you guys on to talk about the 2000s in Florida because it yeah. is it's bonkers. Let's Would do love it. to. All right. As always, thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. Write us a comment. If you contact us on Instagram, we respond to every message. And as always, we don't have a Patreon, but if you want to support the show for free, you know, maybe tell a friend about the pod or tweet about it. Or, you know, even if you want to do it anonymously, that helps too. There was a, uh, I'd like to give a shout out to a uh, Reddit user, Aloha Casey, who posted to the podcasting subreddit that she liked to remember shuffle. And that was really big for us. It helped us a lot. It made us very happy. So thank you. Always appreciate seeing a shout out online. Thanks for listening. Have a good one. Ciao, ciao. Peace. And uh, your moment of Zen is in. Now explain to me, I'm a, uh, uh, oh, what do they call it? Stupid. Retarded. Do you just constantly go to their weddings and baby showers and be like, yeah. Nah. Oh, great. Yeah, I'll bring you another diaper thing. I get the best part. I Why get, do you I get laugh the baby at him? I don't actually think you're that funny. No, I understand. It's, it's a thing. Here's what it is. is. It like, okay, yeah, I know I in Britain they have, you know, wit. But uh, uh, I'm not as good as Benny Hill, and I never will be.